How's it going, everyone? And welcome to the Smack Rob Podcast, your one-stop shop for WWE, AEW, recaps, reviews, and pay-per-view predictions. My name is Vince, and today I am joined by no one. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, uh, my NXT team is feeling a little bit under the weather today, so it's going to be a short one-man team podcast today. We're going to be reviewing today's NXT episode on USA, but before we do that, Make sure you subscribe to us on YouTube. You like and comment and subscribe on this video. Make sure you download this podcast wherever you consume all your podcasts, whether that be on Spotify, iTunes, Google Play, Stitch, Stitcher, Podbeam, wherever we're on there. Make sure you download this podcast. Give it a listen. Let us know what you think. Follow the you can follow the show on Twitter at SmackRobPod. You can follow me at SESVince on all your social media platforms. I also have a YouTube channel. So, you know, I'm here by myself. Might as well plug my own YouTube channel, right? Okay. So, with that being said, um, let's get right into today's show. We had the show kickoff, as you can see on the screen here, if you're watching the YouTube version, the Cruiserweight title match. And it's official. It is now the NXT Cruiserweight Championship. And what a way to debut this new era of the Cruiserweight division. Obviously, Leo Rush won his uh, number one contendership match against Oni Lorcan, And he got the right to face Drew Gulak tonight. And I got to say, it was a really good match. It started off pretty quick off the gate. I think it started off with a Spanish fly from uh, from Leo Rush. It just got Drew Gulak off guard from the get-go. Uh, it's, it's just one of those things where, like, you see a Leo Rush match, and man, you can't blink because the guy just moves at such an amazing speed. Like they call him the man of the hour, but I don't think he gets paid by the hour by the way and the and the speed and the pace that he wrestles his matches. But Drew Gulak tried to bring him down to the mat, try to slow him down, try to use some of his submission skills to like wear down Leo Rush and keep keep him grounded. Honestly, like there's not much to say other than man. What an amazing match by two competitors, both Drew Gulak and Leo Rush. Just, man, just showing you what the Cruiserweights are all about. And if you're not watching 205 Live, since I don't even know what the future of 205 Live is, but I'm really glad it's on NXT because everybody watches NXT on a weekly basis. And if we're going to get more Cruiserweight bangers like this, shout out to Benji for that one. Uh, We're going to... We're just going to be treated to just more great in-ring competition. Uh, Honestly, like I was saying, the story of the match was just Rush trying to, like, push the pace, try to out-quicken Drew Gulak, and Drew Gulak out there just, like, trying to ground him and just, like, make sure that he goes ahead and, like, keeps him on the mat, submits him, make sure he just doesn't go anywhere. But with Leo Rush, that was kind of hard to do. Uh, Let me see. I'm trying to figure out here. Burning Hammer. Uh, Okay, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. The, the, I'm over here trying to take... Yeah, I was trying to look at my notes, but I took a couple bullet points here. Um, I was kind of relying on another, um, on the team to help me out here, but like nonetheless, uh, I remember this one spot where they had him... Juku like had Leo Rush, that is, in like a reverse burning hammer type situation, just slams him, and at that point, it looked like Leo Rush was out of it. Just one, two, and then foot on the rope. Like, it was one of those classic, like, wrestling tropes where you get the crowd in the palm of your hand. You think that the the one guy is going to get the win, and then the other, the other competitor just barely, barely sneaks out a kick out, and... That was just great, honestly. Like, just like that was just great storytelling by both of them. Great storytelling throughout the entire match. I didn't get to see the entire sequence of it, but it was a finish towards the end. Uh, Leo Rush got uh, Drew Gulak into like a prone position on the on the mat. He went for a frog splash, I believe, and then he transitioned, did something else, got Drew Gulak into. Like into the into the in position for another frog splash, which he likes to call the final hour, his finishing maneuver, and he hits it. Uh, it honestly, like I, th- 
I was like I said, I was trying to take notes. I was trying to do some editing on another video, so I didn't catch the entire like sequence of the the ending of that match. But I did see that he hit a frog splash. Then he goes and hits the final hour, so he hits two two splashes on Drew Gulak to get the win. And man, what a day to hit a frog splash and win a championship on the 50s. What would be Eddie Guerrero's 52nd birthday? You win your title your cruiserweight title with the frog splash that that was just amazing to me like uh commentary made note of it i know maros mentioned it beth mentioned it and it was just great because eddie guerrero was one of the greatest cruiserweights that was around during the wcw era and leo rush looks to be positioned as the next great cruiserweight competitor in this new era of the cruiserweight division here on nxt uh like I said, final hour for the win. Um, he's about to be crowned new Cruiserweight champion. William Regal shows up after they show the little video packages. And from there, like, he's he's about to put the title around his waist. When Drew Gulak like, comes in, he's he's hot, right? He's, he's, he's ready. He looks like he's ready, to, like, for another showdown. He looks like he's ready to go one more time. Takes the title away from Rush. Looks at it. Looks at him. And then... Uh, formally hands it to Leo Rush showing that sportsmanship that sign of respect that yes today you were the better man you beat me fair and square you deserve to be cruiserweight champion now honestly that that was that was just one of the things like on the YouTube version that they, they, they made like this really cool edit of um of the cruiserweight title where like the plates kind of is gold instead of silver and then the the actual strap is like the classic black leather instead of like the purple that it has now. And man, that'd be perfect for NXT. It fit exactly with the scheme of things. And I don't know where they're going with the cruiserweight division, but man, surely, surely like nothing but great things to come. So, yeah. So new cruiserweight champion, Leo Rush. Not much else to say right there. Um, Next, uh, well, I was talking about the cruiserweight division. One guy that looks like he might be in line in that cruiserweight division, could especially after his match tonight, is uh, Kushida. You know, he had he he's uh, he's in the main event with Walter. Uh, just crazy to think that NXT and WWE as a whole just have so much talent on their roster that they can just throw in a random Kushida versus Walter match at you on an NXT taping and you're just like wow there's just too many matchups so they hyped up the Kushida versus Walter match following the Cruiserweight title match they did a Finn Balor hype video so you, so they, that was the theme of the night they were really hyping up Finn Balor I think they showed like a total of maybe three hype, hype videos promo packages for Finn Balor showing everything he's accomplished on the main roster and everything he's accomplished on NXT so it looks like big things are coming for Finn Balor uh, they also mentioned the return of Tegan Knox. So she had a little like return package video and she is indeed coming back next week. So Tegan Knox in action next week, two weeks after the return of Dakota Kai, which was amazing. Like, I- I'm so glad to see her return And she did make a return in NXT UK, but now she's, it looks like she's going to be a fixture on the main NXT women's division can't wait i'm more excited uh yeah so speaking of the nxt women's division let's transition to the next match we had going on we had rhea ripley taking on Aaliyah in what basically was nothing more than a squash match um as, as god bless Aaliyah, like she's been in nxt for like forever it looks like it feels like she's been like they're done in nxt since like the very first uh nxt arrival special she she's been there for a while she's never really like progressed in terms of like in-ring competition like she she seems great i have nothing against her personally but like in-ring wise she's still like not the best and this looked just like a show of, uh, of strength for Rhea Ripley it was just basically to showcase her showcase her ability and man she was just vicious nothing but strikes show like like i said show a strength power moves in the end it was just like this nasty ass like like reverse scorpion like i don't even know what to call it like it, it looked like a sharp sh- reverse sharp shooter thingy i don't know and then she, she just slammed her 
kept the submission locked in and just made her tap. It literally lasted maybe like a handful of minutes, like two, three minutes tops. This match lasted and you know, I'm sorry, Aaliyah, but yeah, that, that just happened. Oh, well, uh, after the match, she did get a microphone and she basically called out Shayna Baszler saying that she is indeed, you know, gave her her props, you know, saying that she is the most dominant NXT women's champion in history and that she's t- submitted. She's either made everyone sn- at tap, snap or nap, you know, that. That, that, that phrasing that Shayna likes to use so implying that she's either made everyone pass out tapped them out or broken a limb or two so but she said that she hasn't done that to her Rhea Ripley hasn't been beaten by Shayna Baszler Shayna Baszler hasn't tapped her out and she wants next basically um after that we had a tag team match between Breezango, who came out looking in like an amazing getup. Honestly, like I like like I said, check out the YouTube version if you like, or just you know check it out on t- Twitter, I guess. Uh, but they came out. They had like these uh red uh cut off uh flannel uh, shirts. Uh, on top of that, they had like uh these orange like vests, like security vests, like construction vests with like a uh, like a uh, yellow pail. They. They were, looked like construction workers, and basically the whole gist of it was they were like Chippendale dancers, like male strippers. It was hilarious, especially Fandango when he gets into the ring. He starts like gyrating like viciously, and it's just hilarious because he gets so into character. And then Tyler Breeze, when he's into, into character, he's just so like into himself. It's just I can't I can't with these two. They're they're great, and I love them. F- and I'm so glad they're on the NXT, and I get to see them on a weekly basis because we weren't really seeing them on main roster. But they were scheduled to have a tag team match against uh, the team of Ever Rising. We saw them once before. Uh, I think uh, they had a tag match against Lorcan and Birch. But the match never took place because as their music hits, Jackson Riker comes out. And he's uh, dragging one of the the Ever Rising dudes. uh, And then on the other, he's got the other carried on over his shoulder, implying that he took him out in the backstage area. Then the Forgotten Sons music hits. They start making their way to the ring. They circle the ring around Breezango, very S.H.I.E.L.D.-esque. And before we knew it, like we had the bell ring and an announcement was made that their opponents was the Forgotten Sons, Wesley Blake and uh, Steve Cutler. So impromptu match here, impromptu tag team match, so that's exactly where we go into things like not much to say about this match. It was a very, very good match. I enjoyed it myself. Uh, at one point, uh, Breezango hits a uh, Breezango Fandango hits the sunset flip power bomb, man. It, it was just, it was vicious. It was crazy. Um, I'm trying to see what happened here. Oh yeah. 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 So it was the sunset flip power bomb. They hit onto the outside, uh, and then that's when Jackson Riker attacks Breezango. Um, he attacks Breezango, uh, uh, Fandango, Tyler Breeze. God, I can't talk. See, this is why I need a second person on here to like keep me pace and like bounce off of. But nonetheless, we're pushing through. Uh, like I said, Jackson Riker. He attack. Uh, he attack. Uh, Tyler Breeze. Jeez, I can't talk. Uh, he attacked Tyler Breeze into the ring post. Uh, Fandango went to try to go make the save. He did this uh, tope con hilo. Amazing, amazing athleticism from Fandango. But unfortunately, Wesley Blake comes right at him with another suicide dive. Take dive takes him out. And uh, then goes ahead and they go ahead and Forgotten Sons as a whole, as a collective unit, they put Fandango into the ring. They do a couple t- double team moves, leads into their finishing maneuver, and they get the one, two, three. They go ahead and pick up the win against Breezango. Obviously, you can chalk this up to Breezango not being prepared for Forgotten Sons, and that's what it was. And also the numbers game. So it doesn't. It's not a win. It's not a loss. It's gonna hurt Breezango too much in the long run, but at the same time. Um, it, it it just helps build up Forgotten Sons. I mean, I would have liked to see Breezango. You know, I'm a fan of Breezango. I would have wanted them to get the win. But, you know, I'm intrigued to see where the story goes. And they did make a mention on it on commentary saying that uh, when, Bree, uh, when Breeze came back to NXT, he was actually targeted by the Forgotten Sons and Jackson Riker. And it looks like that story is going to be continuing 
to be told uh, to be told on NXT TV going forward. So we'll see what happens there. Um, another story that looks like it's going to be continued on NXT is Keith Lee versus Dominic Dijakovic. Uh, they had a little promo like on Keith Lee's perspective, and basically they said that the match is taking place next week. It was the rubber match that's being built. So the first match was won by uh, Dijakovic. Second one ended up in a double countout. Two weeks ago, if I'm not mistaken, Keith Lee picked up the win against uh, Dijakovic, and now, like, like I like I stated, rubber match. So we'll see what happens next week, and I'm excited for this match because these guys, man, for two big dudes, they can go out there and just put on the show. They're they're both very athletic and do stuff that most big men shouldn't be able to do at their size. So um, next up, the next match we had was uh, the returning. Boa, um, if you guys remember, Boa was one of the competitors in the breakout tournament for NXT before they went on USA, and he was taking on another uh, another participant of that of said tournament, Cameron Grimes, who I swear comes out every week looking more and more into that new gimmick of his, you know, with the with the top hat, the leather vest. There's just something about Cameron Grimes. He comes in, he's just maybe he's just more comfortable with the gimmick, or maybe he's just found himself, found his groove. But it, he obviously has, because he's come. He comes in, he's got all this swagger. Comes in, match is about to start, and Cameron Grimes like points and distracts the ref and Boa, signaling towards something. And the ref looks away, Boa looks away, but that was his undoing, because literally the match started. And then that's when Cameron Grimes started doing the whole signaling thing, trying to like, uh, trying to uh, go ahead and um, get the refs to be distracted or whatever. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Bell rang. Something happened. I don't know where Cameron Grimes hit that ju- that jumping double moon stomp onto Boa. One, two, three, and then the the camera pans out a bit, and we see uh, Killian Dane is making his way towards the ring, and the minute Killian Dane hits the ring, Cameron Grimes is out of there. He just bolted. He got his win. He got his quick victory. Made Cameron Grimes look good. Obviously, they're trying to build this guy up to slowly make his way to the North American or NXT title picture. Honestly, can't be too surprised. Can't be too disappointed with that. Uh, Boa still looks like he's pretty raw prospect and he looks like he's going to be in developmental for a bit, but the sky's the limit for this guy. He looks like he can be a top guy too. Um, so yeah, Killian Dane came out and he just lays into Boa, just destroys him, beats the other utter living crap out of him. And I guess just basically out of frustration because he lost his match against Matt Riddle two weeks ago. And that's pretty much it. It's just, I guess, trying to get some heat back on Killian Dane. Um, afterwards, we had a Damian Priest promo. Uh, him just basically trying to explain his actions, why he attacked Pete Dunne last week after his match. And the gist of it was that he attacked Pete Dunne was for the attention. That That's exactly what. The, the reason why he did it you know he's he he knew if he attacked Pete Dunn it'd get a lot of eyes on him he's just trying to get his name out there just make a name for himself basically that was just gist of the promo and it and later down the uh, later down in the night they confirmed that he will indeed be facing off against Pete Dunn next week on NXT TV so Damian Priest Pete Dunn, a matchup I didn't really see coming. Didn't think I want to see, but I'm intrigued nonetheless. Hopefully, it's a pretty banger of a match. Next up, we go straight into a match that I had no idea was going to take place until like I saw it on my Twitter feed like minutes before the show. Uh, Roderick Strong defending his North American title against Isaiah Swerve Scott. And man, uh, if you guys aren't aren't familiar with who Isaiah Swerve Scott is man you will after this match if you have if you guys watched it man it's it was just great uh it was just great it started off more of as a mat mat based type of matchup you know Roderick Strong trying to trying to ground uh Isaiah Swerve Scott and it's it's more along the lines of what Drew Gulak and Leo Rush were trying to tell um Roger Strong is actually more of a striker, more of a ground-based kind of guy, backbreaker kind of guy. So he's going to target that. He's more methodical type of wrestler. Where, where Isaiah, he's pedal to the metal, uh, 
full gear right from the start and like after they went from their little like slow mat based ground pay- attack or whatever they went into a strike duel kicks chops forearms all that other good stuff and overall this match was just very very fun and i got a chance to see isaiah back back when he was um uh, uh, shane strickland and man I, I, I'm really hopeful for him. He showed up on 205 Live a couple weeks back, and this is like maybe like his second or third showing here on NXT. Uh, just give the guy some time, man. Like I, I wouldn't be surprised if this guy's going to be like NXT title material like within uh, within the next year. Uh, but going back into the match, uh, let me see. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So. Basically, like I said, really fun match. Action, nonstop, too fast to call. Uh, halfway through the match, though, uh, the rest of the Undisputed Era come out, and they start, like, circling the rings. They're in uh, Roderick's, uh, Roderick Strong's corner. Um, this uh, this uh, this one super sweet kick that uh, Isaiah hits, it's like this flip and Gurry kick or whatever. I have no idea what it was called. He just, like, pulled off moves that, like, you see, like, in a 2K video game, to be honest with you guys. And then, like, at one point, he hits, like, this. So, if you guys remember Del Rio, when he came back at one point, he had, like, uh, the draping, hanging, like, double foot stomp from the corner that he would do. Like, he'd hang his opponents, like, in the middle rope and then do a double foot stomp. Now, picture that, but on the outside. So, Roderick Strong was, like, barely hanging on to, like, the apron area, to, like, the... To like the, yeah, yeah. So the side of the apron, he was basically hanging on. He's holding on from the bottom rope. Isaiah, uh, Isaiah goes ahead and does like a springboard moon stomp onto Roddy. Hits the freaking mat. It looked vicious. It looked rough. Kudos to to Roddy for taking that man. Uh, let me see. After that, oh man, I think after that, like, uh, I'm not even sure how it happened. Like I said, you know, and like. I'm usually working with someone else to bounce ideas off of to like so they can fill in the gaps of the stuff I miss. But after the double foot stomp, Roddy gets control or whatever. Gets oh no 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 he gets tossed back into the ring if I'm not mistaken. Yes okay okay sorry sorry now it's all coming back to me. Um, Roddy goes gets tossed back into the ring by Isaiah. Isaiah is on the apron. He's about to like do some kind of springboard move, but gets caught right in the freaking jaw with a V trigger by Roderick Strong, who at this point probably has one of the best V triggers in the game. Like he's really up there in terms of like best V triggers. Then uh I he hits this running knee that I, I believe Morrow called the buz, the Buzoko knee. The Buzako knee. I'm completely butchering that name. But he hits this running knee, looked vicious. So and then he goes ahead, hits his finisher, the end of heartache just incredible he could have ended it right there no he decides to add insult to injury puts him in the stronghold and then right there isaiah isaiah has to tap out because he just took a lot of a lot all at once roddy's the winner honestly it really just looked like roger strong came into it and he just like so if you guys played wwe games you know what it's like to like save your finishers and you have like maybe like two or three accumulated it looked it that's exactly how it looked like it looked like roger strong after he got taken out with that moon stomp he decided you know what time to go ahead and go on the offensive and use these finishers and get this guy out of the way um that V trigger could have been like a signature. That running Buzoko knee could have been a signature. Then he hits the end of heartache, another, a finisher. Then he goes into his other finisher, the stronghold. It was very video game esque. Very, um, what you call it? Um, um, damn, I'm trying to, uh, trying to, trying to pro wrestling gorilla PWG. Okay, sorry. Uh, it it was a very PWG esque match, and I believe both. I know Roddy for sure, but I believe Isaiah also was part of PWG. So a nice little nod to that that time of uh of their careers. Uh, after the match, Undisputed Era come in. They uh go and celebrate with Roderick Strong. Adam Cole gets uh gets a mic, and he's out here cutting a promo. Uh, just basically putting himself over, talking down Champa and um, and um, Finn Balor, just basically you know just hyping himself up. Basically, uh, mid promo though, um, Velveteen Dream appears on the Titantron. Ty- he uh he's like says, because uh, in the promo, um, Adam Cole mentioned something about Dream. 
and uh, Velveteen made mention of it, said, oh, do you want to talk about Dream? And they, he snaps his finger, uh, Tynatron goes off, the lights turn back on purple, there's a bunch of lasers surrounded by Velveteen, and he's like up perched on this stage setup or whatever, and he's shooting the promo there. Basically, gist of it was uh, more Velveteen innuendos, as you can expect in the Velveteen promo, and he... Um, he was basically saying that he was going to get his rematch against Roderick Strong uh, in two weeks' time. So that's definitely happening. So Roderick Strong versus Velveteen, that's definitely not over. The closing line was, like, when it comes to, like, uh, the Velveteen experience or something like that, you're always going to come up short, right? So he made it like a, you know, small penis joke. And he shows on the Titan Tron, like, the big giant picture of uh roderick strong that he took like the old school Shawn michaels pose but um basically he's just completely naked and he has the uh, the north american title just covering up his crotch area and the velveteen shows that picture snaps his finger and then replaces it with a photoshop version of like the title being completely gone like and it made like a small like like little sensor canceled circle thingy <laughs> implying that he just has a small penis, you know, uh, Velveteen just over there hitting up Photoshop and just getting under the skin of Roderick Strong and the Undisputed Era. But uh, just when you think uh, they had an enough embarrassment, uh, who would who would you guess it? Then uh, Tommaso Champions music hits and he starts making his way down to the ring. So that it. it that was uh that was Champa. He was coming down to the ring, and Adam Cole slowly uh slowly made his way out of the ring. Went along with the rest of the Undisputed Era, they just decided they wanted no part of it. Um, by the way, uh, YouTube version. I'm sorry, I'm snoozing on these slideshows pictures, but there's the Roderick Strong picture for you guys over there. Uh, so yeah, um, Champa comes out. He has his crutch in hand. Um. Gets into the ring slowly. Uh, Undisputed Era just like make their way. They rush the ring out. They they just rush out of the ring, and um, he gets a chair. And he decides to sit down. He made one line and he made his uh, point very emphatic. And he looked. He didn't look at Adam Cole. He looked at the NXT title base and just said, "Goldie, Daddy's home," implying that he's coming for that title. Short, simple, to the point, and. Um, they go to commercial break. They come back from commercial break, and it's uh, Kathy Kelly. She's trying to get an exclusive interview with Tommaso Ciampa after making that statement. And Angel Garza is in the in the backstage area and trying to trying to like finesse that interview away from Tommaso Ciampa, trying to get as much of attention as he can. And I freaking love Angel Garza so much. If you guys don't know by now, I'm like the huge uh, Angel Garza mark right now. Like, I just think the guy is great. He's just hilarious to me. And um. Kathy Kelly's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'd love to get an interview with you, but I have to I have to go now, right now, maybe some other time. And she's trying to catch up to Tommaso, right? And then Angel, Angel Garza chases after her and says, no, 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 really? T for him? You're going to – you're not trying to get an interview with Angel Garza for this guy and stuff like that? And then um, Angel Garza is running his mouth, basically, and then just gets socked by Tommaso Ciampa, and which it's, it was a nice little setup for their match next week. So we're going to get Angel Garza versus Tommaso Ciampa. Ciampa's return match to NXT after uh, after injury. So looking forward to that. Um, I like Tommaso Ciampa. Like I said, Angel Garza is one of my favorite wrestlers right now in the company. It's, it's a high profile match for Angel. And hopefully it's more things to come. He's, he's a heel. He's not going to go out there and just like, be to the get to the top of the mountain top of the nxc title picture like that but him being in the program with tomasha champa signifies that they have good faith in him and know that him in the ring with champa will put on a really good match so following that we had um we had the dakota kai match against bianca belair so another fun match which was the theme of tonight's nxt episode was just fun uh Dakota Kai comes out. She looks amazing, by the way. Uh, she has the little, like, Stone Cold knee brace, which I think makes any wrestler look just amazingly cool. And from and she was, like I said, taking on Bianca Belair. And I love both of these women, but Dakota is one of those people where I feel like 
if booked properly and the story is already there, she could be the one to beat Shayna Baszler for that title and finally dethrone her. But it doesn't look like that might be the case. Uh, it was a classic. This was a classic strikes versus speed. It strikes and speed from Dakota Kai versus the power moves and the strength from Bianca Belair. Back and forth. Uh, it seemed pretty even for the most part, but in the end, it was really just Bianca getting the win with um, the KOD, I believe is her finisher is called. It's an amazing, amazing looking move. And she gets the win over Dakota Kai. I know I'm basically just brushing through this match, but it's just like I didn't get too many notes for this. Uh, I just like, I just sat down and watched it. It was just that good. And it was just, it was just fun. Like kicks, power moves, strikes. All that good stuff, all the works. Another great, great uh, women's uh, match for NXT TV. And uh, after the match, uh, she gets uh, she gets on the mic and she cuts a promo, calling out Shayna Baszler, saying that yeah, I know Rhea Ripley was the first ever NXT UK Women's Champion, but if she wants to get a title match against Shayna Baszler, she's gonna have to go through the EST of NXT, which is her. So it looks like she's not out of the picture, title picture yet. Um, Rhea got a very strong victory tonight as well. Io Shirai got a strong victory last week against um, Mia Yim. So they're building up three major competitors, and they did have a little graphic on on Twitter asking who's next to step up to Shayna Baszler. And right now, it's completely wide open. They have so many people. They got Tegan Knox, Knox re- returning next week. So uh, it's a it's just a loaded loaded division, which. I cannot wait. So let's let's just um, let's just get right into it. Uh, like I said, uh, victory from Bianca Belair, and uh, next next week we have Pete Dunn versus Damian Priest. We have um, Angel Garza versus Tommaso Ciampa, and in two weeks' time we have Velveteen Dream versus Roger Strong. So NXT TV is looking very very loaded, and at at the at the top of the card, we have Kushida versus Walter. Another strong match. Like I said, it's crazy to think that in 2019, we're watching NXT and you're watching Kushida, one of the top draws, one of the top guys, one of the top uh, junior heavyweights in New Japan Pro Wrestling versus Walter, one of the biggest names in the uh, UK wrestling scene, like in general. And man, it was it was a David versus Goliath type of a match. Um, can't say too many bad things about it. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to, I'm trying to like really look back and see what I had from my notes here. Um, yeah, it was. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Okay, 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 okay. Sorry. Like I said, just by myself. But yeah. So they can't say. So they start off the match and it's kind of slow paced. It was uh, just uh, Kushida just trying to feel out Walter and Walter trying to feel out Kushida at um. At one point, Kushida kind of like got the upper hand in a sense where uh, he caught Walter off guard. He started taunting him, like trying to trying to get under the skin of Walter. He uh, Walter's on the outside and uh, he, he looks visibly, visibly frustrated with Kushida because he's not used to dealing with someone of his uh, wrestling style. You know, the strike, the speed, the submissions. So. He's uh, usually a UK guy, so there there's more of a British strong styles type of feel to things. So, yeah, completely different competitor for him. Different different kind of matchup. Uh, he's on the outside. He's frustrated, and we go into commercial our final commercial break before the episode. And when we come back, it's three minutes left on the show. Like I'm literally looking, and it's like three four minutes before the show goes goes off air, and. Um, Man, like they come back and then um, Kushida is trying to do this springboard and he kind of like slips it. At first, I thought it was like a legit botch on his end. But it, the, when they showed the replay, it looked like it was more part of the story. Like he kind of like slipped and he was trying to regroup. But Walter took advantage and it was, I guess, a story plot to uh to justify Walter getting the upper hand. Because surely after that, it was just Walter doing classic Walter things, you know, the heavy strikes, you know, the, the tosses, just like wearing you down. Um, yeah, that was uh, the story of the match. Uh, Kushida just trying to uh, chop down and break down Walter. Walter just trying to like, just pummel the 
utter living hell out of Kushida. Um, I, there was this one cool spot where Kushida tries to actually do a sunset flip powerbomb to the outside on Walter. Walter obviously reverses it and um, gets uh, he, he reverses it. He gets out of the predicament. He tries to stomp Kushida. Kushida gets out of the way, um, gets back on the apron, pushes Walter into the ring post, knocks him out for a bit. And from there, he's on the top. He does his jumping, uh, jumping uh, DDT onto the outside and connects on Walter. And from there, Walter is dazed, right? So he's just completely out of it. Like, Kashida's taking the control of the situation. The the match is going on his pace, on his terms. He uh, at, at one point, they're in the top rope. And he hits, like, this flipping, hover, like, flipping, like, sense on thing. I don't even know what to call it. He just, like flips Walter with him but keeps the hoverboard lock on him right so it's, it's just great it was just just great sequence it was just a top rope move keeps the hold on Walter has Walter right in that hoverboard lock uh, Walter almost almost taps it looks like he was just ready to tap but then digs right deep within himself and finds a way to like will himself out of the submission because he is the bigger guy. He does have the the size advantage here, so he did re- he did get out of the submission and reversed it into a sleeper hold. It towards the end, it was a battle of submissions. At this point, I'm looking at it, and it's the second week in the row where NXT has gone 10 minutes plus on the runtime or close to it, where like this overrun is really helping them out, and it's it's pretty like apparent that they're doing it because of the competition they're trying to get some viewers back after the other wrestling show on wednesday nights is over so they can get some eyes and man like like i said they came back back from commercial with like three minutes left and then for for like the next 10 minutes or so they went out and just put on a barn burner a real banger of a match and maybe that's that's the goal because that's two weeks in a row where like the last match, like towards the last last couple minutes in that overrun, is where they hit that next gear and just man, just just really get the crowd invested and try to get like uh, uh try to get the the fans to come back into NXT. Um, but after like that uh the battle submissions between the two competitors, uh, Walter hits this very like crazy shotgun drop kick so if you've ever seen a Finn Balor match and you know how he sets up the coup de gras, the coup de gras f- with uh, that running drop kick into the turnbuckle Walter did the same thing so imagine the, like a like a, a super heavyweight Finn Balor doing that it was just amazing and then uh, from there hits this amazing power bomb but Kushida kicks out and it was just like the crowd was going off they were they were like this is awesome chance they were chanting for Kushida the entire match they're chanting for Walter it like I said amazing amazing context between the two um but yeah after he hit the power bomb near near uh near fall Walter I guess he decided you know what I'm done this is it I'm over it <laughs> he gets up and when he gets up he hits this rip cord uh lariat onto Kushida looks like he he uh, flips him inside out Kushida sold the heck out of that one two three Kushida takes the pin here Walter picks up the win uh they made a note of saying that yes it was Kushida's first uh uh pinfall loss in um in NXT TV but that it was a hard-fought match and that he uh he he put on a great showing and honestly man if you're looking at these two guys you're looking at like realistic wise, storyline wise, Walter should be the one coming out on top. I was rooting for my man Kushida, man. Everybody loves Kush. Um, I don't know. Uh, hopefully he uh, he gets into that NXT Cruiserweight title picture, North American title picture. I can see him be future NXT champion down the line. Both of these guys look like they have a great future. Towards the uh, towards the end of the of the show, we uh we saw Walter celebrate his win, raise his UK title. Um, camera pans out. Imperium is on the top of the stage. Walter George joins his uh his comrades at the, at the top, and they just do their standard pose and sign off. And that's basically how we ended the show. Um, we we got like Mauro saying like breaking news, ladies and gentlemen from the back. We just got breaking news that we of two major matches in the near future of NXT, and that's when uh Kathy Kelly announced that. 
Angel Garza versus Tommaso Ciampa was taking place next week, and that Roderick Strong versus Velveteen Dream was happening in two weeks' time. So, I don't know. I haven't had a chance to watch AEW, but it was a very fun show. Um, I know AEW is going to put on a good show, but I also know that NXT is out here playing an amazing show as well. It's just great wrestling all around. I'm excited. I'm excited because Wednesday nights have become like the hotbed for great wrestling, whether it's storytelling or just in-ring competition. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I can't wait. And it looks like NXT is just going to keep trotting out great match after great match, so, uh, like intriguing matchup after another. Like today we had Dakota Kai versus Bianca Belair and Io Shirai wasn't even on the show. Kenneth LeRae wasn't even on the show. Shayna wasn't on the show. They're just loaded. And then next week, we're going to get Dijakovic versus Keith Lee. We're going to get Damian Priest versus Pete Dunn. We're going to get Ciampa versus Garza. Uh, man, just three solid matches right there. And we haven't even seen what else is left. It, it, what, what else is there to come? Obviously, the Cruiserweights are going to be joining soon. But I don't know. Uh, I had fun. I enjoyed the show. I mean, let me know what you guys thought, you know, in the comment section down below on YouTube and on Twitter. You know, you could always reach out. Like I said, you can reach out to the show. At the Smack at Smack Raw Pod, you can reach out to me at SES Vince. You know, I'm very you know I'm very social. So you've ever hit me up, I'd be more than happy to like chit chat with you about some wrestling, shoot the shits, and um, yeah, I think this is a good way to close off the show. Uh, so bad, not 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 so bad, you know, for like a one man show. You know, I went 40 minutes plus. You know, kind of went a little bit longer than I thought it was going to. You know, I talked a little bit more than I thought I could, but. Overall, I mean, when you have a great uh, great show to cover, you know, you're going to have a lot to talk about. And I'm excited for next week. Uh, so, yeah, tune in to next week, guys. Uh, we'll be ba- I'll be back definitely for another NXT recap episode. Um, like I said, you can find us wherever you consume your podcasts. iTunes, Apple. No, iTunes, uh, <laughs> Google Play, Spotify, Stitcher, Podbean. YouTube, please go ahead, like, and subscribe to not only the Smack Raw Podcast YouTube channel, but yours truly as well. WWE 2K is coming out, so maybe I'll do something with that. You know, you never know. But uh, I think this is, a, this is a good time to close this off. My name has been Vince. I have been your humble host. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for bearing everything. <laughs> thank, you. thank you for bearing this uh, one-man commentary team. Oh my gosh, I'm just have a bunch of technical difficulties. All right, guys, thank you for listening. You have been amazing. I'll catch you guys next week. This has been the Smack Raw Podcast. Peace.